Max Highlights. And here's your host, Anne O'Donnell. Hello and welcome to your Max Highlights. We take a look back at the best bits of the week in lifestyle and culture for you. First up, a new perspective. Germany's biggest beer bash through the eyes of a photographer. Rare glimpse, open house London is an opportunity to look behind the city's facades. And city history, Karlsruhe in southern Germany was founded 300 years ago. Well, if you haven't already noticed, it is Oktoberfest time in the Bavarian capital of Munich. That means lads and lassies don their lederhosen and dirndls for some serious partying. An international crowd comes to enjoy the traditional Bavarian folk fest, but one particular photographer has captured a totally different side of the event. Michael von Hassel's photo series called Oktoberfest Cathedrals focuses on the empty beer tents at night time. These beer tents at Oktoberfest look like huge cathedrals, at least when photographed by Michael van Hassel. Munich's Oktoberfest is an institution. Every year, the beer tents form a stage for a unique drama featuring millions of people from all over the world. That gave Michael van Hassel the idea to turn the festival's 14 beer tents into the subject of a photo series. I was at a party with a friend, and just for fun, I asked if I could come by with all my equipment on Saturday afternoon, when things really get going and take some photos. And then he asked if he could do the whole thing late at night. The only thing he needed was for the lights to be switched on. I said everyone will have gone home. There's only light for the cleaning crews, but he wanted full lighting. Never before had anyone made such a request. All the beer sellers had to give their consent. But they were intrigued by the idea of taking snapshots of the beer tents late at night when the party was over. This magnitude, this grandeur, you don't find a hall like this just anywhere. Only at the Oktoberfest, in tents holding six to 7,000 people, up to 10,000 in the Hofbräuhaus tent. You don't see that anywhere else on Earth. His pictures walk a fine line between photorealism and photographic art. These are essentially multiple exposures combining seven individual basic images that I took according to a certain pattern, a model, and then merged together to create this impression, this visual language. The fascination these images hold is that they don't just capture one momentary image, but instead they're various images superimposed over each other. That takes an elaborate production process. Many photo artists today print their work because it's relatively easy. You can buy a good printer for a few thousand euros and do it all at home. But I want to be a photo artist, not a print artist. So I've built myself a photo lab where I can make these beautiful photographic prints the way we used to. The 37-year-old has already held countless exhibits at home and abroad. In 2006, the camera work gallery in Berlin, internationally renowned for photographic art, began showing his work. His Oktoberfest cathedrals are on display at City Hall during the famous beer festival. The thing that's so special about Michael's works is how he takes a classic Renaissance technique, the central perspective, and puts a contemporary spin on it. The spin is the overlaying, the superimposing, and the hyperrealism. And it's this combination which is so unique to him. He's the first to discover this style, and it's totally unmistakable. And what's the sign of a great artist being unmistakable? Michael von Hassel originally studied business management and only later got into art. 
In his home city of Munich, his works can also be seen outside of elite exhibition spaces. A Munich department store had him design their sales floor. This is another place where people meet, another context in which I can be a part of the image, and that's fantastic. It's a gift which I gratefully accepted. Van Hassel believes all people need to discover their particular talent. He certainly found his. Oktoberfest visitors can even take one of his cathedrals home as a unique souvenir. To the British capital now, last weekend over 700 buildings were open to the public for Open House London. This annual event is the capital's largest festival for architecture and design. Euromax reporter Megan Lee explored some of the buildings for a look at the historic and contemporary architecture. She had a successful local architect on her side for the tour. London, the British capital. Instantly recognisable through classic landmarks like the Tower of London, Westminster Big Ben and Buckingham Palace. But modern skyscrapers like the Shard or the Gherkin also define London's skyline. Normally these commercial spaces are off limits to tourists, except for one weekend a year during Open House London, when they open their doors to the public for brief tours. I like architecture and photography and uh, I knew I could find great buildings, architecture, uh, inspiration. I'm looking forward to the first building to visit today. After three hours of queue, uh, it's going to be worth it. Catherine Pease is a British architect working in London. She co-founded her own firm, VPPR Architects, six years ago with two other women. She's in her element with Open House London. Open House London is an amazing opportunity to get inspired uh, and see historical buildings that will feed into our projects, but also the newest contemporary buildings and to see what our contemporaries are doing and uh, the direction architecture is going. Next stop, the Pennington Street Warehouse at London Dock in the eastern part of the city. A commercial project that will see this former rum warehouse transformed into luxury apartments, restaurants and cafes. The building is rich in history dating back to the 1800s. It's been closed to the public for over 200 years, until now. I'm standing in what's going to be a really busy restaurant in two years' time. Currently, it's in its original form, an old dock building on the edge of the Thames, which was built over 200 years ago and housed um, rum barrels. It's the first time the public has been able to access this space also for, t for 200 years. So it's really a unique opportunity to see a project before its regeneration. Moving on now to one of London's hidden gems, the Beavis Marks Synagogue, opened in 1701, founded by Sephardic Jews. It's the oldest synagogue in use in the UK, with walls which have witnessed hundreds of years of history. It survived World War II, but suffered damage in the terrorist attacks on London in the early 1990s. What's amazing about it is that it's a very small building in the shadow of the Gherkin. Whereas the Gherkin site got bombed during the Blitz, this, one, this building survived. And very few of these older buildings in this part of London survived. And it's a complete contrast to um, this, this skyscraper next door. And this is a very small, intimate space where you come in through a passageway. You would never know it was here, and it's a complete surprise. Next building on the program is a private residence tucked away in a borough of Southwark in eastern London. The owners chose to build an eco-friendly solid wood structure prefabricated in Slovenia. The house was tailor-made to exact specifications using Slovenian spruce for the walls, while English oak was used for the steps. This house is, is an eco-home, uh, right in the centre of London, and this really represents the way forwards for residential homes. It's got a cedar roof, it's a prefabricated stru structure, ma making it incredibly green, and hopefully more of these sorts of buildings will appear in London in the future. The final stop is not far from London's famous Trafalgar Square in the heart of the city, a throwback to a bygone era when Benjamin Franklin lived in London. The statesman and inventor lived here for 16 years until the American Revolutionary War in 1775. It also served as the first de facto American embassy. 
This house is not only important from a historical architectural point of view, being a Georgian building, which is a very popular type of building in London, built in the 18th century, but it's also really important in terms of the person who lived there, Benjamin Franklin. It's really interesting seeing how small the embassy used to be compared to the enormous building currently being constructed in South London, which is to be the new American embassy. We have seen some wonderful places, I mean we're Londoners, but we've seen wonderful places. It's like being a tourist in London um, all day, where you just go from site to site, um, a glass of wine here and a coffee there, splendid. Open House London gives the public an architectural glimpse into Britain's future while still appreciating its past. Well, the birth of Venus and the allegory of spring are names that we have come to associate with the Italian Renaissance painter Sandro Botticelli. His works have been admired greatly over the centuries. Even today, his paintings fascinate art lovers the world over. Well, this week's opening of the exhibition, the Botticelli Renaissance in Berlin, was packed with visitors wanting to feast their eyes on 150 masterpieces. Berlin's art aficionados came in droves for the opening of the Botticelli Renaissance at the Gemälde Gallery Museum. The exhibition showcases paintings by Sandro Botticelli, combined with works by other artists referencing his motifs. The most famous is The Birth of Venus, here given the pop art treatment by Andy Warhol. The appeal of Botticelli has made him a phenomenon in popular culture. His works have been reproduced so many times. From pop art to the fashion industry in particular, his works address aesthetic ideals that are still valid today. Botticelli is also an event artist. I call him not Sandro Di Mariano, but the phenomenon Botticelli. The exhibition has no shortage of highlights. It includes The Mystical Nativity, the only work signed by the painter. It was completed in 1501. This is the most exciting event here in a very long time. It's fascinating. And I'm only at the beginning. Botticelli's motifs seem to have repeatedly inspired others over the centuries. It shows how modern Botticelli is when his motifs keep on being adapted. My friend and I want to come back when it's not so crowded, although it will probably never be much less so as long as this exhibition is on. Botticelli's in Berlin, and now a lot of people know about it. The exhibition was four years in the making. Preparations included a sophisticated promotional campaign. The organizers began running advertisements months ago in cinemas and on the internet. Botticelli comes to Berlin. Venus of Berlin is an installation outside the museum where visitors can have their picture taken while assuming the divine subject's post on the seashell. The photos are posted on the exhibition website. Never underestimate the impact of a marketing campaign. However great an exhibition might be, if the marketing doesn't work, you'll have trouble getting people to come. We have a range of strong partners for this show that gave us a relatively high promotional budget. And we definitely think it's worth it. Two of the works on display are from the Gemälde Gallery's own archives. They are now on public display for the first time after extensive restoration. Ramona Roth spent several months working on Christ the Redeemer. It was not created by the painter himself, it was a product of his workshop under the master's supervision. There's been some damage to the painting's support. It was heavily infested by insects. They ate right through the wooden board and left only one of the supports intact. And here at the top, it had a number of cracks, and there was a cavity under the paint which had to be filled in again. 
1933, der wieder aufgeführt werden musste. Berlin is often home to major exhibitions. In 2012, a special exhibition centered around the famous bust of Nefertiti drew a record 600,000 visitors to the Neues Museum. Around 80% of Berlin's tourists come to see the city's wide range of cultural attractions. Berlin's official tourist agency takes full advantage of this interest and advertises selected highlights in more than 40 countries. Together with his colleague Anja Mikula, press spokesman Christian Tensler is looking at the options for promoting the opening of Botticelli exhibitions online. Berlin braucht als Museumstandort als With so many museums and so much culture in Berlin, you need beacons. We have more museums than rainy days per year, and I think some people might be overwhelmed. But if you give them a highlight, a blockbuster, then they'll know that if they go there, they'll see a great exhibition and have the memory of a unique experience to take home with them. The Botticelli Renaissance exhibition is expected to attract 250,000 visitors. It runs in Berlin through the start of 2016 and will then be moving on to London. Well, there is always something new to discover in Europe. This time, it's a dessert shop in the British capital. There is a Scotsman who has very high hopes of changing an age-old tradition in Britain. He wants to introduce French pastries to Britain's afternoon tea time by tempting people in the upscale Belgravia district to indulge. Bon appétit. French pastries and delicacies for English afternoon tea. And that's not the only break with tradition. Here at the William Curley Boutique in London, customers sit at the bar to eat. It's all the idea of Scotsman William Curley. He worked in top restaurants in Britain and France before opening his first dessert bar in London in 2009. I like the idea to try to, to, to make things more uh, done in front of people, so I guess you touched on the sushi bar kind of concept where you can see things being made in front of you. I, 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 lo I love how people can get close to what we do, I think that's very important. Uh, and and, and I, get, I guess maybe the day is sitting on a table hidden away, we want to be a bit more open, more, more, a more open space. For us, he's going to make his signature chocolate cadeau. The main ingredients, lots of eggs, sugar and of course, chocolate. He begins with the base, which is a light sponge. He whips up sugar and egg whites till it forms stiff peaks. Then he adds the egg yolks. And finally, cocoa powder. The mixture needs to go into the oven quickly before it can deflate and become heavy. I think what I'm trying to do in a, to a certain extent, and I'm not the only one, but there's a handful of us in the UK, it's quite pioneering if you want. We're trying to bring French patisserie into the UK market. Step number two is creme brulee. The seeds of a vanilla pod and then the pod itself are added to cream, brought to the boil and then covered with cling film to allow the aroma to develop. He then whisks egg yolks and combines them with the hot cream. The mixture is then baked in the oven. Once the cakes have cooled, they will be placed in the freezer. The third step is the chocolate coating. Chocolate flakes are mixed into melted couverture chocolate to give it a crunchy texture. For, for all the senses, absolutely. You look at everything, you hear everything, you smell everything, you see everything, and most importantly, you taste everything. The chocolate mix is then spread onto plastic sheet molds and allowed to dry at room temperature. These can be any shape, it doesn't have to be a cone. The final step is the mousse au chocolat for the filling. With afternoon tea pastries, they tend to be smaller and they tend to be two or three, if that makes sense. Well, I, I kind of like to concentrate on uh, a, a patisserie as a dessert, if that makes sense. So when you have it, it's your own, uh, you'll go through all the stages if you like, of the process which we touched on, the flavour, the texture, you know, the beauty and the dish it's, itself. Afternoon tea in England normally features scones and clotted cream, along with fairy cakes and miniature sandwiches. They're not much more than a mouthful so that guests won't spill the filling. Tea is, of course, a must. Plus, it's considered suitable for any type of pastry. Mm. 
But William Curley wants to shake up this tea tradition. At his bar, guests can spend all day relaxing, relishing the French pastries. I think in the UK, you know, where traditionally people would maybe have an afternoon tea with two, three pastries, scones and finger sandwiches, I think as a patissier, I thought it's time now that London had its own high-end patisserie shop. So I guess from the influence, you know, from my training in France and what I see in France, I've kind of brought that here to, to London. Back in the kitchen, the chocolate cadeaux are being assembled with the mousse au chocolat, the sponge, the frozen creme brulee and sultana soaked in rum. For William, this is the best bit. To garnish, he adds a little gold leaf. Presentation is, after all, everything. This patisserie is very popular at William Curley Boutique and even enjoyed outside of tea time. Right now, we are heading to the southern German city of Karlsruhe. It was built in the early 18th century, and this year it's celebrating a very big birthday. Legend has it that Margrave Karl Wilhelm III was inspired to build Karlsruhe after he had a dream about a palace with streets leading out from it in the shape of a fan. Well, he made that dream a reality 300 years ago. So this year, the city is in a festive mood. Karlsruhe streets fan out from one central point, the Baroque Palace of Margrave Karl Wilhelm III. It was built 300 years ago as his royal residence. The dynastic wars of the 17th century had destroyed many old castles, including Karl Wilhelm's residence in the nearby town of Dulach. The new building was modeled on the French architectural style. It was standard to build a Baroque palace with several wings, but it seems Karl Wilhelm wanted to have the side wings set at an angle. Roads then fanned out from the palace and the city spread out along the same lines. In 1718, Karl Wilhelm moved into the new palace together with his mistresses. He left his wife back in Dulach. The palace was later home to the electoral princes and Grand Dukes of Baden. Today, it houses the Baden State Museum. To mark the city's 300th anniversary, it's running an exhibition on the founder. Karl Wilhelm was certainly someone who loved to indulge, a man of many passions, and he had numerous affairs too, but he also liked to be in control, to rule. But that was typical of the day. He believed in absolute power. Karlsruhe suffered extensive damage in World War II, but many older buildings have survived. The city is home to lots of students. The many trams also shape the face of the city. The tram network dates back to 1877, when the race course opened. They've been powered by electricity since 1900. The Protestant city church is another highlight. Built in the early 19th century, it was modeled after a Greek temple. Karlsruhe has plenty on offer for art lovers. The Kunsthalle is one of Germany's oldest museum buildings. The neoclassical edifice was built especially to house the collections of the Margraves of Baden. Now its exhibits include artworks from the late Middle Ages to the present day. More digitally-minded visitors should check out the Center for Art and Media, the ZKM. Housed in a former munitions factory, it's a factory for ideas, a space for experimentation, and also a museum. And it's putting on a special exhibition to mark Karlsruhe's 300th birthday. Nothing's on fire here. It's part of an art project called Cloudscapes. The artificial cloud is one of the exhibition highlights at the ZKM. Karlsruhe is proud to be celebrating its anniversary, focusing on the place where Karl Wilhelm laid the foundation for his palace and the city 300 years ago.
That's all we have time for today. If you wanted to revisit any of our reports, just head to our website to dw.com forward slash English forward slash Euromax. We will be back with more next week. Thanks for watching. And from all of us here in Berlin, goodbye, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.